Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. We were camped, parked right beside a remote creek at the north end of Harrison Lake. The creek was frozen over, very cold, snow on the ground that was not fresh, heavy forest surrounding us. However, we were in a clearing. It was near Mount Carey or Harrison Lake near the Lillooet Main Logging Road. I have not seen one. However, I was in a location that is notorious for Sasquatch sightings. I have now discovered which has made me look back at an experience I had in February. We were on a camping trip on the northeast side of Harrison Lake, British Columbia. Anyhow, we were basically in the middle of nowhere on a nine-day camping trip with a Chevy pickup and a camper on the back. I went out one night to chip ice off the side of the river for our drinks and had an eerie feeling of being watched. I quickly ran back to our camper that night, I woke to our camper being nudged slightly and heard a very deep sniffing sound as though something was outside smelling all around the truck. Our bed was located in the camper above the cab of the truck and whatever it was was tall enough that its nose was at that level. I froze in fear. My husband was sleeping soundly and never noticed anything. We had been there for a number of days at that point, and all the snow around our camp spot was trampled down and hard-packed ice, so I found no tracks. I will never forget that, nor would I ever return there again. It makes the hair on my neck stand on end to this day. I have heard in recent years that the Harrison Lake area is somewhat of a hotbed for Sasquatch activity but I have not heard of any other first-hand accounts other than ones in books. On the north end of Harrison Lake has a flat river bottom surrounded by high mountain walls with numerous smaller feeder valleys and creeks. On to the next one. In the northwest area of Reed Island, approximately 30 meters from the shoreline, this was near the Campbell River. I would like to share with you an experience I had in the summer that was most unusual. I am hesitant to suggest that my encounter was indeed a Sasquatch. Although I am open to the possibility of their existing, I would personally require visual evidence of my own to feel certain. That summer, I had become slightly lost while hiking with my then four-year-old son on Reed Island a non-ferry serviced Gulf Island off the coast of British Columbia's Vancouver Island. I left the wooded path and decided to walk along an old logging road, thinking that if I followed it long enough in any one direction, I would eventually reorientate and find our camp. That island is not that large. We stopped at the roadside to pick some wild berries. It was approximately 2 p.m. I heard what sounded quite distinctly like a hiker walking swiftly through the thick brush, approaching behind the thicket of berries. Being lost, I called out, hello, hello, feeling relieved that I was about to encounter another person. The footsteps stopped quite suddenly after I called out. I had the strange sensation of being watched. The footsteps began again, but slower. I called out again, but became anxious because it sounded as though whoever it was was sneaking up on me. I was scared it was some hermit freak. I felt very vulnerable and started to back away from the berry bushes into the middle of the road. Then whatever was behind those bushes emitted a surreal noise that I find very difficult to describe but cannot forget. It was a very loud, deep growl that became almost a roar. I grabbed my son's hand and we ran as fast as we both could. It is my understanding that occasionally a bear will swim onto the island. The noise of whatever was moving through the brush did not seem like the big, slow noises bears make. 
I've had bears wander into my camp before, and you can usually really hear them coming if the brush is thick. Anyway, there it is. On to the next one. On a clear-cut block 50 kilometers west of 100 Mile House near the Gustafson Lake, we found footprints about 16 to 18 inches long in three different areas. I worked with a silviculture company doing slashing work at the time. I was working on a 50-hectare block with one other person. The country is on the Fraser River Plateau and is very dry at this time of year. We started work late, about noon. My coworker started a half hour earlier than me because I had some stuff to do. When I finished, I went down the ripped up road in the east corner of the logging block. He was working, but when I came into view, he came to meet me. He seemed a little bit confused. We leave our equipment overnight and have never had anyone bother to move or steal it. But this time, he said that a safety helmet had been moved and he had trouble finding it. He said he found it about 100 yards northeast of where his helmet was in a hole that excavators had ripped up. They were excavating for tree planting. I looked at his helmet and there were no scratches or marks because I suspected a bear. We went back to where his helmet was found and were looking for tracks. In the clay mossy ground there were about four 16 to 18 inch tracks nearby. I had felt uneasy working near the tree line near the end of the day's work at around nine o'clock. We were slashing and cutting out diseased pine seedlings. It was around 1 p.m. in very dry country with mostly lodgepole pine trees not far from the Fraser River. On to the next one. In the Browren Lakes, 500 miles north of Vancouver, this was Spectacle Lake, the opposite side of Portage. Everybody was sleeping but me. I was awakened by a fairly loud knocking noise about 200 yards behind our tent. At first, I thought it was some of my brothers or my cousins screwing around, but that couldn't be since they were all sleeping right next to me. So I shot out of bed and ran over to my dad's tent and started screaming in a loud whisper, Dad, wake up. It's Bigfoot. Listen. There was a big meadow that had a moose trail to it. My cousin and I found it in the evening before, and we saw a few moose. We heard the Sasquatch on both sides of the meadow. My dad told me to go down to the direction of the other one that sounded further away and hit a tree a few times. And shortly after that, he heard the reply. It was not an echo. To the one 200 yards behind our tent, and that happened a few times. We got the camera and got dressed and headed behind our tent. We didn't hear them hit the trees anymore because they probably heard us coming. As we were creeping back there, we would hear branches cracking, and I felt we were very close to him or her because we heard what seemed to be a very heavy human taking very big steps. We looked at each other and knew what it was. We were both almost speechless. The whole trip there, there were no wolves howling, but the night before the incident, there were a lot of wolves howling. That was a very rare incident. I believe that it was at Campsite 49, and it also had a bridge that went over a swamp. There were a lot of big fir trees and a lot of ferns. On to the next one. Near Port Alberni. I was out camping on Vancouver Island near the Stratacona Park on the Port Alberni side of the mid-mountain range of the island. Just before dark, I heard a loud crashing noise coming up the creek toward my camp. The first such noise I had heard in three weeks of camping, I thought it was a bear. I didn't have my rifle with me, so I made a lot of noise, banging pots and pans together. The bear went away. In about 10 minutes or so, a loud, drawn-out scream of something came from across the lake. I've been a woodsman all of my life. I'm 54 and was 51 at the time. I'm familiar with the various animals on the island and what they sound like. I have never heard that sound before or since. 
On to the next one. I worked on a wildfire near the town of Golden in British Columbia. The fire was about 180 kilometers off the main highway. It was in this remote location. We were flown in by helicopter to the top of the Alpine above this fire. Once landed, we waited for the chopper to return with some equipment for us. Myself and my buddy went to go check for a water source for our pumps. We found a small patch of snow in the Alpine, and in the middle of it, we noticed there was a footprint. The strange thing about it is that there was only one footprint in the middle of the snow patch that was about 30 feet wide and 20 to 25 feet long. It was approximately 12 to 15 inches long, and you could clearly see all the toes still. There was no way someone could have made these because of the location we were in. On to the next one. I was on the hunt, working my way through the timber between Zinc and Solidite Creeks, with my end goal being the surrounds of South Tower, which was in full view to my northeast. Having reached the point where I was about four hours into the morning, I thought that I would stop for a break, when suddenly I began to hear the low, gurgling caw of a flock of ravens. It seemed to be coming from just ahead of me. At this point, I couldn't see the birds, but could only hear their distinct caws. I hiked onward, being stimulated by the calls of the ravens, and wondered what the ruckus was all about. I had moved forward through the timber about another 75 yards or so, to a point where I could see the raven circling in the sky just ahead of me. The raven is considered to be one of the smartest of birds, being deemed able to solve a six-piece puzzle. They seek out nests of other birds, and when found, one raven will distract any bird that may be protecting the nest, while the other robs it blind. The ravens, however, were not playing the part of the robbers this day. Rather, they were circling over what I believed was a bear or cougar devouring something below them, waiting on high for the spoils to be left behind. Not wanting to stumble upon a feeding bear or cougar, I was approaching the area with great caution. As I slowly made my way through the trees and brush, I could now see the raven circling directly above me, but still I could see no reason on the ground for them wanting to circle above. I had a relatively good view of the entire area, shy of being able to see behind every tree, but I could see no evidence of a predator feeding on anything within the forest. It was then that my eyes caught the movement well up into one of the taller pines, and lo and behold, there was a gigantic Sasquatch clinging to the side of the tree, alongside of what appeared to be a large twiggy raven's nest. Upon seeing the nest, it became obvious why the unrelenting circle and cawing was taking place in the sky above this location. The raven's nest was being raided by a Bigfoot, the Sasquatch was at least 75 feet above the forest floor, with its legs wrapped around the tree's trunk, while holding onto an adjoining bough with one arm around it. He was reaching repeatedly into the nest with his other arm. I would then see its hand go to its mouth. Over and over again, the beast was repeating this movement, which indicated to me that it was eating the chicks or eggs that were within the nest. The ravens circled and cawed in vain, unable to stop the Sasquatch from devouring their young. With turnabout being fair play, apparently the tide had been turned. The nest robbers were now the victims of a robbery themselves. It was truly remarkable to watch. I watched the beast carrying on its activities as I remained well hidden below, in the forest some 40 or 50 yards away from where it was. Eventually, it seemed to have had its fill of whatever was available in the nest and began to climb into an ever higher position in the tree. 
there was yet another raven's nest in the boughs above it. This creature was now well above a hundred feet in the tree, and based on its apparent size, I was wondering whether the surrounding boughs could support it. No sooner had this thought entered my mind than did I hear a loud crack, the Sasquatch, having been caught unaware by the branch breaking, came tumbling down through the tree, smashing its body at a variety of angles against numerous branches until it reached a point where it was in total freefall about 30 feet and hit the ground with a tremendous thud. I watched as this beast laid apparently dead on the forest floor. The ravens rejoiced above him, landing in the boughs over his body and cawing in a chorus as they looked down at him. It was incredible to view what was happening before me. I thought to myself that the Sasquatch had to have died from being the victim of such a brutal fall. But then I saw one of its arms lift from the ground. The beast slowly rolled from one side to another and groaned as it did so. With every groan that the Sasquatch made, the cawings of the ravens became louder and louder, with many of the birds now descending lower and lower in the tree, as if to taunt the crippled beast even further. Remarkably, after some twenty minutes of groaning and rolling about on the ground, the Sasquatch made its way to its feet. With its left arm hanging limp, it began to stagger away into the tree. The Sasquatch, as it fell through the tree, had broken through and bounced off at least eight large limbs, which were somehow between four and eight inches in diameter. Some of them broke as his body hit them, while others he simply slammed into them, which caused his body to flip and tumble, out of control until he hit the ground. I don't know how anything could survive such a fall, let alone walk away from it. When he lay on the ground, his face was initially down until he began to roll over and back and forth. This was followed by him standing to his feet, at which point his face was still not visible to my eye. His height was between eight and nine feet tall, and he was perhaps five feet at the shoulders. As soon as the creature had hit the ground, the ravens descended in mass, landing in the lower branches and swooping over the body as if to taunt him for receiving his just reward. There must have been fifty or more large ravens cawing in unison as if a victory had been won. It was just unbelievable. On to the next story. I have been researching Sasquatch for many years. I found a plethora of evidence from footprints, tree breaks, and recordings of vocalization, but hadn't yet had a sighting until one fateful night. I was out with friends and fellow Sasquatch researchers, Tim and Jeremy. We had certain areas we often visited, with this one being a hotbed for activity. We'd been out all day and were about to wrap it up for the night. It was about 10.30 at night, roughly, and we were driving out. I asked him to pull over to see if we could see any deer. He had a big Ford F-150 with KC lights mounted on it. We stopped and looked around for a while, but saw nothing. He finally turned the truck off and killed the lights. I stepped out with a 4D mag light in hand, turned it on, and scanned the area we couldn't see with the truck's light. I crossed over a field with tall weeds and saw a set of neon green eyes glowing. I asked Tim to look at what I was seeing. Tim and Jeremy both came over and saw what I saw, a set of eyes moving from left to right just above the top of the weed. Now, I judged the weed stood about four feet tall, so I thought this thing had to have some size. I could see the eyes moving, but when it appeared to look straight at us, the eyes appeared to be every bit of 10 inches apart, making whatever it was pretty large. I'll be honest, my first thought was this was probably a horse because I couldn't quite make out what it was, just the eye shine. We stood watching it go from left to right 
until it disappeared into the wood. The entire time I was thinking to myself that this thing was really big. We talked for a bit before a light, misty rain settled in on us. We decided to hop back in the truck and go get a cup of coffee. Just as we pulled out to drive off, Jeremy said he wanted to go confirm the height of the weed, as he didn't believe they were as tall as I said they were. We agreed and pulled the truck into a place where we now could use the KC lights to assist us. Jeremy got out and headed over to the area. As he was moving through the weed, we were hollering at him to go either left or right to better help guide him to the exact spot. When Jeremy hit the weeds, I now saw that I was wrong. The weeds were bigger than I thought, making whatever we saw that much larger. Jeremy stands six feet, and the top of the weeds were at his shoulder. As he was moving along, he kept looking back to the truck, but couldn't see due to the KC light blinding him. I was navigating him by giving him direction, and he was moving along nicely. When he got to within 40 yards of where we'd seen the eyes, they appeared again right out of the brush. The eyes were staring right at Tim and me. Alarmed, I hollered out to Jeremy that the eyes were back again. I still thought this was probably a horse. Jeremy asked where the eyes were, and I told him they were to his right. He promptly turned and headed that way. He was about 30 yards away when, shockingly, this thing stood straight up and now towered over everything around it, including Jeremy, making him look like a 10-year-old. The glowing eyes were now looking down on Jeremy from underneath the overhang of a tree. My first thought when I saw that this wasn't a horse was that Jeremy was dead. There was no way we'd be able to get to him in time. Now my mind tried to rationalize the thing was probably a bear on its hind legs. All I kept saying to myself was, that is one big bear. I hollered out for Jeremy to freeze. Jeremy did as I ordered. After years of researching together, he knew I don't panic, but he could hear it in my voice. I then shouted that he needed to come back now. Jeremy didn't hesitate. He began to walk back toward the truck. From his vantage point, and because the lights of the truck were so bright, he still couldn't see what we were seeing. After Jeremy retreated 15 yards, Tim and I finally got a good clear look at what it was. It swung its shoulders around and pivoted to go back into the woods. The KC lights caught it just right allowing us to see its back arms, buttock, and leg. With its full back facing us, I could now see how wide its shoulders were, and I swear it was every bit of four feet wide. It was covered in blackish-brown hair that was thick. It took a step and disappeared into the heavy canopy of the woods. It then dawned on me that this wasn't a bear either. I think back on that night and now believe the first time we saw its eyes, it was on all fours crossing the field. We reported our sighting, and others came out to find evidence. They measured the overhang where it finally stood up and came back that it was over eight feet. This makes sense, as Jeremy appeared like a small child in comparison to it. After all the times I've spent in the woods, the countless hours, the cold night, and hot summer days, I'd finally seen one. What had been legend was now reality, and I'd never be the same. On to the next story. I was, at the time, and am still a resident of the state of California. Let's just say that I live within a hundred mile radius of Sacramento. If you feel as though I'm being a bit elusive by saying this, you would be correct in your presumption, for the tale which I'm about to spin is centered on gold, and I will not be offering any tips as to where I do my panic. Fact of the matter is that as of the time of this event, and until this present day, I have panned, shall we say, north of $500,000 worth of gold. In 2008, I was panning in one of the many locations in which I worked. Having hiked in for several hours, 
just to get to the location. Whether or not it's a creek or a river, I'm not willing to say, but suffice to say, I was near what I will call the headwaters of this particular body of water. It was a location where the water was descending through a wide rocky crag, which formed the starting point for the body of water. This crag or chasm, whatever the proper word may be, was wide and deep as it cut through the rock. Throughout this gap was strewn a million years worth of rocks and large boulders that were heaped upon one another like a bucket of rocks. I had been in this location at least a dozen times before and had never once thought of attempting to navigate its boulder field to investigate what may be on the other side. It was October 27th and the weather was already getting a wee bit cold. The sky was blue and I had been panning for about two hours. I had just stepped away from my pan in order to relieve myself and as I stood there, I suddenly had the strongest sensation that I was being watched. So strong was this sensation at the time that I almost felt as though something was trying to enter my mind. I know this all sounds very strange, but it was like a pressure was building within my mind that seemed like it was trying to take over my thinking. For whatever reason, I turned my head to my left, looking directly into the chasm, and saw a large, hairy head ducked down behind a boulder, some fifty feet within the edge of the pile. Turning my head back in front of me, I kept a watch out of my peripheral vision, hoping I would see whatever this was again. And I did. I caught it moving between two large rocks, where it was once again concealing itself from my view. Most people would think I was out of my mind as to what I did next, but I had my pistol, so I was not without some type of protection from whatever this creature was. I took a good-sized rock and threw it into the pile, just to the left of where I had seen it move. I heard a grunt of sorts, which reminded me of the Scooby-Doo cartoon character dog. This time, I stood my ground, watching and waiting, and it paid off. The creature stood up and looked directly at me, and I knew it was a full-blown Sasquatch standing in the boulders. Our face-to-face -face standoff lasted but 20 seconds as the creature turned and started to work its way back through the boulder pile, heading north into the chasm. I began to give chase, struggling my way through the pile as I could already see that the Sasquatch had gained a considerable lead on me. It had no issue whatsoever negotiating the stones while I was stumbling and bumbling my way through the field. For some 30 minutes, I had entirely lost track of the beast, but I was unrelenting in my pursuit. I came to a break in the canyon wall, where there seemed to be what I will call a natural cave formed in the rocky wall. At this point, I was about 40 yards away from the cave and was resting while standing between two large boulders. It was then that I began to hear what I will describe as a loud conversation between several very distinct yet unintelligible voices coming from within the cave. They were very loud, and the cave opening was acting like a speaker. What was being said, I do not know, but it sounded like bad Chinese in a subtitled movie. The creature which I had followed through the field into this area appeared to be a female, a fact which I bring up having seen what appeared to be a breast as it was climbing over the rocks on all fours at one point. It seemed to me that I was hearing a family of sorts, perhaps talking over the sighting of this weird human by the female. I sat there for almost two hours listening to the sounds coming periodically from the mouth of the cave. Nothing else came out of or went into the cave. So I began making my way out of the area. One of the most remarkable things about this encounter was the agility that this creature demonstrated. While negotiating this random field of boulders, for somebody in the best physical condition, it would have presented quite a challenge, as it did for me. And yet the Sasquatch moved through like a children's obstacle course. At one point, 
I watched as it stepped from the ground to the top of a four-foot-tall boulder with a single step, hoisting its body up with nothing but a single leg movement. Its body was shaggy, blondish red color, and I would estimate its size as being seven feet tall and maybe five feet wide at the shoulders. The rest of the body was fairly uniform in width, starting with the thighs and working up to the upper back, being perhaps three to four feet in width. It was just out of this world amazing. My great aunt Jasmine and great uncle Bill live in a charming cottage in a Washington town called Dayton. There's a lot of dense forest in that area, so it's not all that surprising that it hosts at least a couple of mysteries. The last time I went there, I stayed for about a week. I'm from Seattle, so my dad drove me there and dropped me off. My aunt and uncle had a daughter who is my dad's cousin, but she died of a terminal illness during her teenage years. Maybe they invited me because it made them feel like they got to relive some of their time with their deceased daughter. And although my parents would probably never admit it, I think it was a clever strategy they took advantage of to get some time alone. I was pretty angsty back then, so I'm sure it was a relief for them to have me out of the house for a bit. Even though I found it kind of boring to be in Dayton, especially during the summer when my friends were out and about every day having a great time, it was hard to disregard its beauty. I likely didn't realize it until years later, but visiting there did seem to invite a certain calmness into my life. During those days, I spent way too much time all stressed out about who was dating who and who was best friends with who, you know, statuses that were forever changing. When I was in Dayton, my brain was efficient at muting a lot of that nonsense, especially after my aunt and uncle introduced me to these things they referred to as the orbs. Their house was situated beside a vast prairie that looked like it was straight out of a storybook. Some of the plants were so shockingly high, sometimes making it look more like a cornfield than a prairie. Before I even knew what was in there, I remember looking at it and getting an indescribable feeling. I suppose it felt like someone was always looking at me from within, even though I couldn't see them. And when I learned about the things that lurked in there, that feeling felt so much more justified. One evening, my uncle was outside on the patio, sipping what was probably a glass of whiskey on the rocks. Aunt Jasmine was inside preparing dinner. Take a seat, he said, scooching over so he could make room for me on the porch swing. It was a raised porch, providing a much improved view of the meadow compared to ground level. I walked over and sat down, instantly entranced by the overwhelming number of fireflies that lit up the prairie. That scene was so poetic, and I remember thinking my relatives were so lucky to get to look out at that every summer night. Ever seen a spirit, my uncle asked as he sipped from his glass. He said it in such a casual way that I wasn't sure how to respond. Before that point, I had never much considered that kind of stuff to be real. Um, I don't think so, I said. Well, this field here is full of them, he replied. Really? I said, staring out into the prairie that now felt more like an abyss. What do they look like? Like big balls of light, Uncle Bill said. Kind of like glow bugs, only larger. A part of me now thought he was BSing, but the other part of me felt he was genuine and was trying to share with me what could be a special revelation. How often do they come out? I said. Nearly every night. And they leave you alone? That's right, he said. Uncle Bill's confidence in the matter was starting to creep me out a bit. It's interesting how truly vulnerable humans are to the fear of the unknown. Not too long after the sun had completely set, I spotted what looked to be a faint glow emanating from a distant section of the expansive meadow. For whatever reason, it seemed that the fireflies were keeping their distance from that area. Or, I suppose it's possible that the aura could have just outshined the tiny insects. Suddenly, the aura began moving to the left at a steady pace. 
I felt like there was something mechanical about how it moved, as though it had been programmed or controlled by an external force. And keep in mind that was my perception before I knew anything about orb theory or knew that other people saw these things while out in the woods. After the aura traveled a few yards to the left, it paused before heading in the direction of the house at an identical pace. Uncle Bill didn't seem at all disturbed by that. It was apparent that he had had enough experience viewing those things to know they wouldn't get too close. I thought it was so strange how Aunt Jasmine was inside casually preparing supper while we were out on the porch observing the peculiar phenomenon. How could anyone act like any of this was normal? And that was before things got even weirder. I almost fell out of my seat when a very abrupt snarl caused the aura to halt. What was that? I whispered, tightly gripping the porch swing's armrest. The noise was unlike anything I had ever heard before. It was more closely related to something from a monster movie than any real-life creature. That's what the spirits look after, Uncle Bill said, still calm and confident. It was easy to tell he was enjoying my fresh reaction to all that was happening in the meadow. What? I whispered, terribly confused and nervously awaiting the next perturbing occurrence. Before either of us could say another word, I watched as a cone-shaped head protruded from another section of the prairie around 15 yards to the right. Although it was dark in that area, the moonlight was strong enough to expose the silhouette. The shape of the head reminded me a lot of a silverback mountain gorilla's head. Since it was turned to the side, I could see the prominent facial features, its mouth open wide while it projected a noise that I had trouble differentiating between a bark and a cough. I think it's safe to assume that the vocal cords of these creatures are so different from a human's. As far as I could tell, that creature paid no attention to us. The head remained visible for just a few moments before lowering into the thicket. What was that thing? I finally managed to ask Uncle Bill. It's a Bigfoot, he said. A clan of them sleeps in this field during the summer months. They have been for many years now. There's more than one of those in there? I gasped. This all happened before I had any idea that this was a species. I can't say I put much thought into it before, but I had just assumed that there was allegedly one legendary creature out there. The notion of them regularly reproducing just like any other animal was an entirely new revelation for my young brain. Everything that was happening was so mind-blowing, invoking such an overwhelming feeling. If it hadn't been for my uncle's composed demeanor, I would have fled into the house long before that point. Then, even though I could no longer see any of the creatures, a violent shaking within the meadow indicated that something was racing from its location toward the aura. It was remarkably fast, and the orb was aware of it. Right away it rose above the tall grass at speed much quicker than anything I had ever witnessed before. After the orb was fully visible, and maybe around 20 feet up, a large arm exploded from the meadow, reaching for the glowing light. Though the creature's charge appeared aggressive, its reach felt a bit more playful. After that, I heard a few more noises similar to the previous one. They sure sound active tonight, Aunt Jasmine said, reaching her head out of the window and causing me to jump. She was smiling and seemed just as calm about all of it as my uncle. Dinner's ready, she added before withdrawing her head inside. I was so stunned that I found it hard to eat. I was far more focused on getting to the bottom of what felt like such a dreamlike experience. Do you ever have dreams where utterly bizarre things are happening, but the people you know are acting like it's all so normal? That's exactly what this was like, only it was really happening. My relatives clarified that they were just as surprised by the activity within that prairie when they first saw it, and it didn't start occurring until several years after they moved to that property. Also, they had heard the animalistic noises for so long before actually seeing a Bigfoot or an orb. Because of that, they felt a bit of confidence that the creatures had no interest in harming them. 
They said the orb didn't come around until after they started hearing the Bigfoot noises. Although I was amazed by everything, I had already heard and seen. I soon realized I didn't want to see more. My dad was already coming to pick me up the following day, so I sort of left it at that. I told him about the bizarre occurrences during the drive home. He seemed open to hearing about it, but I'm not sure he believed my interpretation of it. To this day, I don't understand why I seem to be the only relative that my aunt and uncle shared that stuff with. It'll forever be known to me as the Great Prairie Mystery. On to the next one. My Grandma Sue was always one to worship the woods. Having spent nearly her entire life in a suburb of San Diego, she longed for a new adventure after Grandpa Dean suffered a severe stroke and passed away on the way to the hospital. Because he died inside an ambulance, Grandma decided that she no longer wanted to be around those emergency sirens. I've seen her cry on multiple occasions due to the noise. It had always been a dream of hers to live in a small cabin surrounded by flowers. But she also didn't want to be too far from her grandkids who would stay behind in San Diego. Therefore, she settled on a small home in a little California town known as Idlewild. It worked out great because we could drive to visit her in just a couple of hours. Also, she got a steal of a deal. The previous owners took her offer immediately. I remember my grandma saying how it seemed like they were in a rush to get the place off their hands. Of course, now I have a strong hunch regarding why that was. I'm the oldest out of my siblings and the only girl, so that's probably what sparked an extra special bond between my grandmother and me. Because of that, she would often invite me up there on the weekends. I've never been much of a party girl, so I usually accept her invitations. There was something I really liked about Idlewild. It seemed like such a quaint town with a friendly community. In the summertime, they frequently hosted these concerts that I'd attend with Grandma Sue and a couple of her friends. I guess you could say I've always been a bit of an old soul, so I fit in nicely with them. But things started to feel a little worrisome when I got up there one weekend and noticed my grandmother's energy was different. There were cameras and rolls of film all over the house. Additionally, the kitchen was a mess littered with baking products and used dishes. Grandma had always been very orderly. Therefore, the current environment right away made it seem like she was going crazy. At least the place smelled great. Hard to beat the aroma of warm pie. Grandma, is everything okay? I asked when I watched her burn her fingertip on the hot pan. Her mood felt like this odd combination of nervous excitement and exhausted. Yes, yes, more than okay, she replied. Something big has happened. So big, you won't believe it. What do you mean? I said, utterly clueless. I've had a visitor, she said. I've been feeding him, and I want you to help me get a photograph of him. I began to suspect she was implying that a bear had been coming around, and she had been leaving food out for it. But it still didn't make much sense why there would be so many cameras and rolls of film everywhere. Did she really need that many pictures of the animal? Uh, sure, Grandma, I can help you with that, I said, reluctant to hint that she was coming off as weird and obsessive. He usually comes around early in the morning or just after dark, Grandma said. That was when I noticed she had baked enough pies for a bake sale. I remember asking if she wanted to go for a walk since I got the impression that she hadn't been outside a whole lot, but it was like she didn't even hear me. For the next few hours, I assisted Grandma Sue in the kitchen. Whenever I asked her to clarify what kind of animal we were hoping to get a picture of, she would tell me she didn't want to ruin the surprise. It wasn't even dark out yet when I felt my grandmother tapping my shoulder while I was at the kitchen nook. When I swiveled my head to ask what she needed, I immediately saw it. A face weirder than I could possibly imagine. I felt like it had to be fake. There was something about it that reminded me of an animatronic movie monster. I'm sure part of that reaction was due to the natural tendency to deny something so unorthodox to my views on this existence. 
I empathize with those who say they can't quite place these creatures into a box. They're their own thing entirely. I believe people compare them to the great apes only because they have similar anatomies and can walk upright. Perhaps it's also because of the immediate evident intelligence that surpasses most other known creatures. Something about its posture and the look in its eyes conveyed that it was capable of complex thought. I'm going to hand him a pie, and I want you to fetch the Polaroid camera from the den, Grandma Sue murmured enthusiastically. Without saying a word, I turned and walked as quietly as possible out of the kitchen, my heart thumping so fast I almost felt like I was about to faint. How was any of this real? Almost zombie-like, I picked up the Polaroid camera from the coffee table and quietly walked back into the kitchen. Grandma Sue was opening the window above the kitchen sink where the creature continued to wait on the other side. It wasn't making any noise. I didn't hear so much as a single breath. As crazy as it might sound, it seemed like it was trying to be respectful but my instincts were already telling me that it wasn't a good idea to get the creature into a routine of expecting to get fed. After the window was opened wide enough, my grandma used both hands to extend one of the pies toward the creature. Not yet, Aaron, my grandma said in a calm and soothing tone. I'll let you know when. That was when I got my first look at the massive palm and fingers on that creature. It's tough to comprehend just how much power it must have been in that gigantic hand, wrist, and forearm alone. Yet, it was so notably gentle with the pie, it turned to the side while it scooped the pastry into its mouth, occasionally licking its fingers like a human. Okay, now, I'd like you to take a photo while I'm handing it another pie, Grandma Sue said to me. Maybe come just a little bit closer. I did as she asked. And as she extended the second pie toward the massive creature, I aimed the camera and snapped the shutter. As soon as the device made that mechanical noise while it printed the photograph, my grandma screamed. The creature grabbed her forearm and bent it, instantly dislocating it from the elbow joint. Then another gut-wrenching set of snaps. It was before I even had a chance to react that the creature was no longer in sight. And Grandma Sue was staring at her dislocated arm, hands and fingers screaming out in agony. All I could think to do at that moment was pull out a chair from the kitchen table and place it beneath her. I was worried she was about to faint from her extreme state of shock and needed to make sure she didn't fall and clunk her head. After she was sitting, I rushed over to close and lock the windows above the sink, getting another look at my grandmother's set of dislocated joints. I dialed 911. Grandma Sue was still in shock when the police arrived, so I had to do most of the explaining. I told the authorities everything exactly how it happened, even though they looked at me with skeptical expressions. It surprised me that they didn't interrogate either of us any further. That leads me to believe they must have dealt with other situations involving those creatures. At that time, I didn't care that the police confiscated every roll of film in the house. But nowadays, I find myself wishing I would have at least hidden the Polaroid photo that I took. I didn't even get to look at it after it was fully developed. Grandma Sue ended up needing surgery and months of physical therapy after that day. And she went straight from there to a nursing home. She was never even close to the same after that hellish event. A few years later, she passed away in her sleep. On to the next one. I used to live a pretty normal life as a housewife back in Joplin, Missouri. However, that all changed shortly after my husband and I lost our only child to an accident that I'd rather not disclose. Both he and I concluded that the only way we'd have a chance of being able to cope was to make some drastic changes in our lives. That's when we decided that he'd quit his job and we'd leave behind what we had considered a safe and stereotypical existence. As a means to escape, we rented our house to a nice young couple and immediately purchased an RV. It was such an interesting change of pace for the two of us 
because it turned out that neither of us had ever ridden in one of those things before. I thought it was going to take some time, but it quickly started to feel as though we should have been living that type of life all along, even while our boy was still with us. It was truly the first time in my life that I felt free from the shackles of society. It's interesting how it took a change of this caliber to get me to recognize what I had been missing out on for the first 32 years of my life. We traveled all over the U.S., meeting all kinds of interesting people and eating a variety of food that I likely never would have tried if I hadn't been coerced into doing so. However, this adventurous life wouldn't continue without a scare. Another thing that I should probably note is that we were in the second year of our travels by the time this disturbing event occurred. We were parked in a very isolated spot in the Yosemite area, and it was our third night in that particular location. Every once in a while, we'd come across a location that we both loved, and we'd sometimes stay for as long as two weeks when the scenery was beautiful, and we weren't asked to vacate. I remember that it was midway through spring, so it was still a bit brisk in the air, especially during the night. It was around 2 a.m. when we were abruptly woken by the sensation of the rear end of our vehicle plopping onto the ground. My initial instinct was that we had just experienced a minor earthquake or tremor. But it was a few seconds later that we again felt the back of the RV rising above the ground and we could feel our body sliding down the mattress. Aside from our whispers, we couldn't hear a thing. We continued to lie there in total darkness, scrambling to come up with a logical explanation for what might be happening, but it was no use. It was as my husband tried to stand on the now slanted floor that we finally heard what sounded like a very deep breath coming from a very large man. And it was right after that, that the RV plummeted onto the rugged terrain. All of the windows were cloaked with blinds, making it impossible to see anything until one of us could peel them back. My husband always wanted to sleep without those things, but I had this nagging fear I'd wake up in the middle of the night and see someone staring back at me. I don't think I would have done the same thing, but my husband managed to stumble his way down to the steering wheel and slammed his palm on the horn multiple times. My hunch that this was a bad idea turned out to be correct as the front of the RV was quickly raised, causing my husband to fall backward. It was as if whatever was doing the lifting knew that the noise would stop if it could move us away from the driver's seat. Fortunately for me, I was standing just in front of the bed at that point so the mattress was there to soften my fall. Nonetheless, that was when things started getting more intense. My husband was lying on the floor while it felt like the vehicle tilted past the 45-degree angle. It was beginning to feel as though we were about to be tipped over by the mysterious and magnificent force that lurked outside. I've never been interested in guns or any other kind of weaponry, but this was one of those moments where I questioned why I thought it would be okay to travel without protection. Recognizing that this was no earthquake, my husband began to yell at whatever was out there, somehow thinking that he'd be able to intimidate it with just his voice. Surprisingly, this did cause the RV to drop again, but it wasn't long at all before something started to slap against the outer walls. By this point, Shards of various objects, such as wine glasses and mugs, were scattered about the floor, making things even more complicated on account that we had to watch where we stepped. My husband finally mustered up the courage as well as the balance to peel back one of the blinds, and whatever he saw startled him so much that he yelped and fell backwards. Unfortunately, he ended up planting his heel on a large fragment of glass and let out another agonizing squeal. It was as I began rushing over to aid him that I saw the face pressed up against the small window. I only saw a glimpse before it fogged up the glass, but I have to say it was enough to stop me dead in my tracks. 
This is likely going to sound strange, but if you've ever seen the movie Swamp Thing, that's what this face sort of looked like to me, only covered in fur rather than sludge, or whatever it is that the Swamp Thing is composed of. I don't recall its mouth being open at the time, so I'm unable to say whether it had canines or any other sharp teeth. Its nose was wide and flat against its face, much like what you see on a gorilla. Honestly, I'm surprised I even remember those details, considering how petrified I was, somehow avoiding stepping on anything sharp. I took two or three glances at our aggressor as I walked over to help my husband into this little booth that was on the left side of the vehicle. That was when I was able to hear the terror in his voice. He trembled as he spoke. What the heck is that? He said with muffled words. That especially freaked me out because he had never been one to get scared by much of anything. Suddenly, he seemed less like an adult and more like a scared child. As I returned my focus to the small window, the face was no longer visible to me. My husband was grasping his foot, so I flipped on the lamp that hung from above the booth. My eyes were immediately drawn to the blood that was already flowing from his heel, along with the piece of glass that was protruding from the thick layer of skin. Luckily, we had a pair of tweezers nearby because it wasn't all that uncommon for one of us to get a splinter while walking around barefoot outside the mobile home. It was as I was carefully extracting the glass that he gestured for me to become completely still. He had heard something else outside. Not long after that, I began to hear this bizarre communication that was taking place not too far off from the vehicle. It sounded like some kind of foreign dialogue between a couple of male humans. I couldn't understand any of it, but I remember thinking that their tones were rather casual given the circumstances. I wanted to believe that someone had driven by at the right time, spotted the aggressor, and managed to scare it off before it could inflict any major damage to our home or us. However, a handful of strange animalistic sounds were woven into the dialogue, making it quite clear we were the only humans in the area. My husband and I must have sat there in silence for 10 to 15 minutes before the voices eventually dissipated. Shortly after that, the ordinary sounds of nature returned. It is true how that happens when these mysterious animals are nearby. After treating my husband's foot, we remained in the booth, trying to get a bit of shut-eye while trying to remain prepared for the aggressor to return. Believe me when I say it was the longest night of my life. Even when the sun finally rose, it was hours before either of us gained the courage to crack the door open to take a peek outside. Though there were a few imprints that surrounded the ground of the RV, none of them looked much like anything. I did end up finding a pile of excrement somewhat close to the rear of the vehicle, and we even kept a sample of it and sent it to a laboratory for testing. Unfortunately, we never received a response. I don't prefer to be pessimistic, but I do have my doubts that the sample was ever examined. That's something I wish we would have put a little more thought into before making any moves. Believe it or not, we continued to carry on with our travels almost as if nothing had ever even happened. Of course, we were both much more frightened than before, but I think it was more or so the reluctance to return to stereotypical life that kept us on the road. Even after all this time has passed, I still have trouble believing what happened that night. If it wasn't for someone else being there with me to confirm everything, I'm not positive I would have remained convinced. Though we do continue to enjoy the great outdoors, I can't imagine ever camping in anything as minimal as a tent. I have major respect for anyone who has run into these animals while tent camping and then regained the courage to get back out there with nothing but a piece of fabric between them and whatever's out there in the wilderness. On to the next one. My encounter with the Sasquatch species happened a long time ago, while I was canoeing in the Stillagamish River in Washington State. 
I was with my son, who was in high school at the time, and this incident is something we still talk about to this day. Frankly, I've always thought the event to have brought us closer together. My son went through a phase where he was really into the sport of kayaking. We're from the state of Michigan, and until he was old enough to drive, we'd spend many summer weekends kayaking various rivers within the state. Even though he had a lot of fun on those trips, he would often mention how he wanted to paddle some extraordinary river out in Colorado or the Pacific Northwest. Well, when his birthday rolled around, I surprised him with the itinerary for a trip to Washington for that upcoming month of June. The kid was ecstatic, and it was an overwhelming, satisfying feeling to see just how much joy that gift brought his way. Of course, I had no clue that this trip would be memorable for a variety of reasons. My wife has never been much of an outdoorsy type. But she was always very encouraging of my son and I to get out there and enjoy what nature has to offer. And even though she wasn't interested in participating, she was extremely supportive and would ask our son to tell her about the trip. I want to say we would have been camping in Washington for nearly a week and had already completed three kayaking trips before we embarked on our journey down the Stillagamish River. For whatever reason, we decided to switch things up a bit by renting a canoe rather than the duo of single-person kayaks. This way, we were aboard the same vessel, which made it easier to maintain discussion as we observed and admired our surroundings. Those kind of trips are truly perfect for bonding with your loved ones. There seems to be something about being immersed in nature that sparks great conversation. It encourages you to drop your guard speak up about any insecurities you might have. It's probably needless to say that a barrage of anxieties often torments teenagers, and this was when I learned from my son that he was embarrassed by how small he was in comparison to so many of the other boys his age. Luckily, I was able to communicate to him that I went through the same thing at his age, but would end up going through a growth spurt only a year later. Something that I should mention would end up happening for him around the same time. If you're parenting teenagers as you hear this, I highly recommend you take them on this type of journey. I think it's inevitable that you'll grow even closer. Anyway, enough of why we were on this trip. Allow me to explain what made this journey unforgettable. We had been paddling for a couple of hours, and I want to say we were a little less than halfway finished with the route. I can vividly recall how our dialogue was abruptly interrupted by the sounds of birds fleeing from a couple of trees that were off to the right side of the river. Both of us swiveled our heads in the direction of the commotion and immediately saw the multiple dark shapes that were running along the terrain that was only a little bit above the riverbank. Of course, our paddling came to a halt. At first, I could only assume we were looking at a large group of black bears. However, I knew enough about bears to know that they weren't pack animals. Additionally, though these entities were on four limbs, they weren't moving in the way that bears do. There was something about the limbs that reminded me of the way monkeys run throughout the treetops. It was very nimble. From where our canoe was positioned, there looked to be at least ten of these creatures. Their feet didn't seem to make much noise when they touched the terrain, but we were able to hear a series of strange grunts, growls, chirps, and even whistles. The noises that these creatures made didn't resemble anything I had ever heard before, although it was clear that they were heading in the same direction as us. One would sometimes circle another one and nudge it with its hand or torso before resuming what almost seemed like a race. Whatever they were, they seemed like a very social bunch, I don't remember feeling very scared at the time. Perplexed would be the more appropriate word. However, there was something about my son's body language that made it obvious he was pretty intimidated by what we were seeing. Hey man, it's all right, I whispered to him. We're fine. They can't touch us while we're out here. But it was as I returned my gaze to the riverbank that I saw two of the entities were now standing in the water on two feet and looking at us in silence. I somehow hadn't even heard anything 
step into the water while I was speaking to my boy. Since there was now a length of about 40 yards between us and the physically intimidating creatures, my gut told me to start paddling closer to the opposite side of the river. However, another inner voice warned me that it wouldn't be wise to show my son that I was frightened. On the other hand, I was quickly growing more and more worried about what I was supposed to do if these large creatures were to charge our canoe. Even with the other creatures continuing to move about in the backdrop, there was something about the two entities that stood in the water. They were just so stoic and statuesque. Another thing that sticks out in my memory is how there appeared to be an absence of color in the eyes. Of course, it could have been the distance that divided us from them, but they just looked like black marbles. Both my kid and I agree that their faces had human characteristics. To me, they looked like extra-wide human faces with notably high foreheads. In other words, I suppose you could say they looked how I would imagine early humans to look. I wasn't able to make out what the contents of their mouths were like as their lips were closed. I'm not sure whether it was because the lips were so large, but the shape made it appear as though they were pouting. These things were barrel-chested as can be, equipped with long but muscular arms since their lower portion of their legs were submerged. I was unable to see if the feet were as gigantic as some others say. The natural current of the river continued to take us further away from the creatures, but it was probably around 10 minutes later that we again spotted them running on all fours near the riverbank. I didn't mention it to my son, but I was becoming worried that we were their primary interest. I thought, what if they were hunting us? What could I possibly do to protect my teenage son? After that second sighting, we never would see them again. The idea of Bigfoot wasn't the first thing to cross my mind. I was well aware of the subject, but I suppose I grew up assuming there was only one of them, akin to the Loch Ness Monster. When I think back to it, that assumption was a bit ridiculous. How could there possibly be only one specimen out there? When we first spotted these entities racing through the woods, I guess I assumed we were looking at some other kind of rare species that hadn't been documented yet. It's never been clear to me whether it was because of that incident or not, but my son seemed to grow out of his kayaking obsession after that trip. However, it was at a point in his life where he started spending a lot more time with girls, so that could easily be the reason. Since then, my son and I have watched a boatload of documentaries that revolve around the subject. We've even met up at a couple of conventions and would probably have done more if timing always permitted. Whenever I'm at those types of gatherings, I can't help but wonder how many attendees have had their own experience with the species. That's an idea that's always intrigued me. I don't think we'll ever know with 100% certainty that we saw a group of Sasquatch that day. But all these years later, I have still yet to come across a single practical explanation. Whatever they were, they must be at the very top of the food chain. On to the next one. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!